Well, hello everyone and welcome to this Endcare Species Guide Remastered series. Now, this remastered series of Endcare Species Guide is where I take my old videos and produce them again with either the same or more and better information if that applies and the most important thing is a better production value. Now, if you want to watch the original video on this end species that I'm doing today, I'll leave an eye card over on the top there where you can see the original video, which is a hidden video on my channel. Okay, so let's begin. So today we're going to be talking about Mesor Barbaros. Now, Mesor Barbaros is the first end species I've ever kept, and I like them a lot. They have a very special place in my heart, and it is one of my favorite ant species. They are very beginner friendly, which was great for me when I started out. So I hope it's great for you if you're starting out or if you just want a very interesting species because they are very interesting, especially when a little bit of grown up, you know, when you have a, a good amount of workers in the colony. Okay, so there are three variants of this harvester ant. The one is the, the one where the workers and queen are all fully black. Uh, the, you know, all the three segments of the body are black. Now there is a variant where the, the head is red. It usually shows in the queen and the majors, though some workers may have it as well. There's also another variant where the head and the abdomen, and sometimes in the queen, the thorax is red. Now the abdomen and the head will show red in majors and in some of the workers. Now I say that because it's weird to differentiate what's actually a major from what's actually a worker. That is because Mesor Barbaros has a very polymorphic range of ant workers. So if you got from the smaller worker to the major worker, you don't have just smaller workers and just major big workers. What you have is the whole range of sizes. And I'll talk more about that when we get to sizes. But first let's talk about the climate that they live in. Now being from South Europe, they can withstand a wide variety of temperatures because they are temperate ant species. Now, they usually live in grasslands, which even further heightens this ability to withstand different amounts of temperatures and humidities, because grasslands in the, in the area that they are from do vary a lot over the year, the week, and the day. Let me talk about that for a little bit. So, when it comes to humidity, they can take anything from 30% to 70%, and they can withstand a little bit above 70 if need be, but you should keep them below 70. Now, they do appreciate having drier parts to their nest because they do eat seeds and they have to store them and to not have them germinate, they need a dry space to store them. However, you should have at least some part of the nest which is above 50% humidity because that will really help in the development of the brood of the ants. The pupae do well in dry conditions and they don't really care about humidity, but eggs and larvae really do seem to grow faster and better in this uh, more consistent above 50 humidity, okay? So keep that in mind when you're building and uh, watering the nest, okay? Now, in the outside, it's it's whatever. Just don't keep the outside too humid. It's, there's no reason to do that unless you have to, but if you do, they'll probably start to sometimes nest outside and they're very much photophobic. But if you actually train them to be accustomed to light, they might end up nesting in the outdoor or just out in the open, which has happened to me once or twice. So, the thing is, when it comes to temperature, that they can withstand a wide variety as well. They can withstand anything from 20 to 35 degrees Celsius, and especially a little higher than 35, they can withstand it for brief periods of time. So even to 40 degrees Celsius, they'll be fine as long as they, as long as they don't stand, they don't stay in that for too long because that will make the adult ant workers die off quickly, all right? And the ant queen will not be able to lay as many eggs as it would be necessary to account for those losses. And it, it will also put a big strain on the queen. Now, the best uh, area for them to develop in when it comes to temperature is 21 to 26 degrees Celsius. In my experience, the the best that they'll do is 26 and 27. From what I found, they really do prefer that little higher temperature. Now, here's the thing. 
Mesa Barbaros exists in a wide variety of locations. So what happens is there's populations of Mesa Barbaros which are more accustomed to different types of temperature. So the ones from where I live do appreciate the high temperatures. And what I found talking to people and how they keep their Mesa Barbaros is that you should take the temperature that is normal for a day, like the, the medium daytime temperature of a, of a spring day in your area, which in my area is 25, 26 degrees Celsius, and that is the best temperature for your Mesa Barbaros amps, because that's a good balance between too hot that the workers die off too fast and the queen has a lot of strain put in on her, and not too cold to where the queen can't lay eggs and the, the brood cannot develop fast enough. Okay. So in my opinion that's the perfect range. When it comes to hibernation, they do hibernate and they do hibernate for a very long period of time. They hibernate from November to February. And they usually hibernate at 15 degrees or a little bit below. I wouldn't keep them below 10, but a little bit above 10, not above 15, of course, because then they will wake up. So when it comes to sizes, I've mentioned that they're polymorphic, but let me put some numbers on that, okay? The queen is usually 15 to 20 millimeters, which is pretty big. Uh, it's one of the biggest harvester, ant harvester ants out there, which is nice to see and to watch. Uh, the workers are usually anywhere from 3 millimeters to 15 millimeters. Now, 3 millimeters is just the nanitics. The workers from the second generation onwards, the smaller ones, are usually above 5 millimeters. Some of them are very small, more like 4, but the nanitics are really, really small and you can really tell the difference between the size of the nanitics and the size of the, of the workers that come in the second generation. Nanitics are the first workers that hatch from a batch laid by the queen, which in this case is claustral, by the way. Now, this range from 4 to 15, you've got workers of all the sizes in between. And the bigger majors, uh, as you go from 4 to 15, the proportion of head to body size uh, grows as the size of the ant grows. So the bigger the ant, the bigger the head is compared to the body. And that is because the, the major workers are usually tasked with both defending the nest and crunching stuff which is both good and the problem. So uh, colony size, this colony, though they are naturally monogenous, they can grow to great sizes. They can grow to up to 10,000 ants. And in the wild, they've been recorded to grow a little bigger than that. In captivity, it depends on husbandry and care and space. So maybe not 10,000, but count with a good thousands of ants, okay? Because it'll be very fun to watch them once they're big. They'll be very active outside once they are big numbers, okay? When it comes to nutrition, these ants eat primarily seeds, which they turn into ant bread. The, the smaller workers can do that with softer seeds, but the majors can crunch up basically any seed that they can find in their natural habitat. So everything that you give them from seeds that us human eats, like sesame seeds, from stuff like grass seeds, which is the best for, especially for smaller colonies, to like, Sunflower seeds, the, the, the major workers can't crush up sunflower seeds. Now they'll turn the seeds into this sort of paste which is called ant bread and they'll feed off that. Now, technically they can get all the nutrition and water that they need from seeds, but you can't really give them the same variety and the same types of seeds that they find in the wild when they are in captivity. You can try and you should give them as much variety as possible, but you won't really get there. So you have to complement their diet with insects and some more water. Now in the wild they do hunt for insects as well, but it's not something they do very often. They usually just stick to seeds. Now the seeds you want to give them, anything that you would feed birds or yourself is fine. Just pay attention to the fact that they, don't, they, they can't have any sort of pesticides and stuff like that because that will kill your ants, okay? One of the things you don't want to do is just go out and buy a bag of uh, grass seeds and have that have some sort of pest killer and it will kill all your ants. Now when it comes to insects they take everything fairly easy. Mealworms I think are their favorite because they are very juicy and provide a lot of water which is something that lacks in the seeds that usually you can give them. Also 
to make sure they have enough water, you should give a water reservoir, a test tube uh, with water and a cotton stopper so that they can have as, as much water as they need, okay? So they don't exactly need to have a water source. They can extend themselves very well off of insects and seeds when it comes to hydration. But if you fail to give them the types of seeds that have more water or if you fail to give insects for a while, they will die of dehydration very, very quickly. So keep in mind that it's better to have a water reservoir for them. Okay, so th these seeds, in order, they store them in the nest and they'll eat them as, uh, as they go along. So with, when the worker force is very small, what you have is the workers come out, get seeds, go inside, and then they never come out again until the supplies of seeds that they have inside start to drop. So you won't see them outside too often, but once the colony gets to like 50 and 100 workers, they'll be outside very often and from there on it's just an exploding population numbers and an exploding activity outside the nest. So given that they store the seeds inside the nest, you must, you must give them, as I referred, that space of dry uh, area so that the seeds don't germinate and they're still good for eating a long time after they've been collected. When it comes to behavior, these ants are very active outside when they get big numbers, as I mentioned, and they are very cool to watch because they are big enough to be completely visible and admirable by the naked eye. They also create the big trails that I've mentioned in the beginning in your setup once they get to huge numbers. Now, that's a behavior that comes with the couple hundred workers, work, workers in the workforce, okay? One other thing that you have to keep in mind when it comes to behaviors is that if they are crammed in space, they'll try to, drink, to dig out chambers and the, the mages can chew through almost anything that you can break with your fingers. So stuff like white song, they'll chew through that. But in my experience, the stuff that they say in the internet that you can't keep them in plaster, white song, etc. is not really true. They will not try to dig out and they're very passive about escaping. So unless you have them crammed in space, they won't really try to dig out your nest and to escape and stuff like that. Also in the outworld, they live most of their time on the ground in nature, but they are surprisingly good climbers. However, they don't really test your barriers too much and once they see, eh, I can't go past there, then they don't go past there. So they don't really test you a lot unless they're lacking food, water or space. They're not really a species that you can control the population of with space or almost anything because they'll do a lot to get more food and to get more space. They are very eager to grow, I'd say. There's not an ant species that's very passive about staying the size they are, which can be cool, can be a detriment, but they are very easy to take care of. They are very, very easy to take care of. You can just feed them insects once a week and have them have seeds in the outworld for them to eat whenever they want, which is a very passive ant care. Also, uh, a quick note if you're planning to do something a little bit more complex with your setup, they do drown in open water, they have a tendency to do that, which is kind of weird, but basically there's no open water sources anywhere near where they live and nest because they don't really like the high humidity that comes with soils next to lakes and rivers. So they're not uh, evolutionarily prepared to deal with open water. So if you have a small lake or a puddle in your setup or something like that, they will drown. So don't do that. Offer them water through a test tube, okay? Now, I think that's all, so uh, I'll see you in the next one, I guess. Bye-bye!